Okay, folks, it's day 302 of this war in Ukraine, and uh, actually some really amazing events have just taken place. Uh, yesterday, Zelensky went to Washington, D.C., first trip outside the country since the war began. He spoke with a joint press, uh, press conference with President Biden. He also spoke to Congress, and I'm going to cover all of that here. And by the way, let me mention one more thing before we get started. If you will try to hit a like or leave a comment or something, this will help the, the YouTube algorithm to, uh, you know, recognize that people like this kind of thing and spread it a little bit further. So thank you for doing that in advance. All right, here we go. So first thing before I do is I want to show you, um, I posted this in the community tab. It's a link to this where I just put my iPhone up and we watched the thing together. We had commented together. We gave play by play of what's going on as far as I could see. Uh, if you want to watch that, you can get my thoughts on how things happen in real time. I had to step away for a couple minutes, but otherwise that's what it is. I'm not technologically savvy enough to know exactly what to do other than set up my iPhone. I understand I could use something like StreamYard, I, but I don't know how to set it up, but I'll, I'll figure that out eventually. So I can do live streams with you. Okay. Um, now let's get into some articles. Standing alongside Zelensky, Biden pledges aid to Ukraine for as long as it takes. Now, there, I'm going to go through a number of the same kind of articles to highlight different things, so just stay with me. President Joe Biden told Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky that the U.S. will stay with you as long as it takes. That's a great signal to be sending to Putin, and he knows that he's sending that signal. One of the problems is that after the way that we left Afghanistan, we sent terrible signal to Putin about weakness. Um, and I don't know that we were sending strong enough signals to Putin all along the way to keep him from doing this. So this is sending a strong message. $45 billion pledge of military aid is sending a strong message to Putin. Uh, and we need to keep doing that kind of thing. We understand in our bones that Ukraine's fight is part of something much bigger, and that's exactly what it is. Uh, Zelensky's been saying it, but I think that that's, that's true. If um, Ukraine loses, it sends a terrible message to dictators all over the world. Yeah, you know what? Maybe it's worth it. Let's, why, why don't we do that with our pet project, whatever that is, Taiwan or wherever. So you just, just have to be aware of that. Zelensky said, we need to survive this winter. I know that American leadership will be strong. Regardless of the changes in the Congress, I believe that there will be bipartisan and bicameral support. And he said that on at least three occasions. And I pointed it out as we went through about how many times he said that because he was, and I predicted this yesterday, that he was really going to be speaking to Republicans trying to get a core conservative resonating message hey, the, the kinds of values that, that we're pursuing are your values. Not to say anti-Democrat values or something that's opposed to that. He's trying to thread a needle very carefully, trying to shore up waning support on the Republican side. Uh, and I think he did it very well. This is uh, PBS NewsHour, and uh, you can watch the whole thing here, or you could watch it with me. Okay, the Ukrainian leader predicted that next year would be a turning point in the conflict when Ukrainian courage and American resolve must guarantee the future of our common freedom, the freedom of people who stand for their values. I think that was a great line. There was thunderous applause from members of Congress. And to show you what that's like, let's look at this. Here's his speech. Our surrender. Yep, look at that. Look at a standing ovation for that they will never surrender. That's right. I see one guy not clapping. So, so here in the front line. Okay, so what I did was I went through and I just gave the analysis as I saw it play by play, answered questions as people had questions, and that's what we did yesterday as we evaluated the speech. Uh, thunderous applause from Congress. Zelensky rejected Biden's framing of a just peace, saying, for me, as president, 
just peace is no compromises. And he was making that point very clear. He said that the war would end once Ukraine's sovereignty, freedom, and territorial integrity were restored, as well as the, quote, payback for all the damages inflicted by Russian aggression. And again, you have to end it on the battlefield, cause Russia to say uncle in order to get that payback, in order to get the children that have been stolen back, in order to get things restored in, in any meaningful way by Russia. Okay, just before his arrival, the U.S. announced an, an $1.8 billion, billion uh, military aid package uh, for Ukraine, and that includes Patriot missile systems, uh, and it goes on and on and explains some things, but here's those last two points I want to show you. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer opened a chamber session by saying that the passage of the aid package and confirmation of the new U.S. ambassadors to Russia uh, would send a strong signal that Americans stand unequivocally with Ukraine. Okay, that's all well and good. But what was really good was that there was bipartisan discussion where you had the Senate's top Republican, Kentucky Senator Mitch McConnell, said that the, quote, most basic reasons for continuing to help Ukraine degrade and, and defeat the Russian invaders are cold, hard, practical American interests. Okay, that is what... Zelensky needs more than anything else. Yes, you need the Biden administration to be supporting and whatever else, but you really need to shore up the Republican side here. And I think that was really helpful for McConnell to be saying. Okay, The Guardian carried the story of how uh, Zelensky sounded like Churchill when he came to Congress. And here we see him on a tour. It takes a lot to impress the long in the tooth politicians. Long in the tooth, by the way, means old. Right. The tooth has grown out a long time. OK. Long in the tooth politicians. But Time magazine's person of the year uh, has a combination of star quality and steel core. That was enough as every member rose to their feet, applauding and hollering. And you saw it with your own eyes. You saw them applauding. Uh, he stood at the same spot that the American presidents do when delivering the State of the Union address, but cut a very different figure with short, dark hair and a mustache and beard. Against all odds of doom and gloom scenarios, Ukraine didn't fall and Ukraine is alive and kicking, he said. More than one historian uh, compared the visit to Winston Churchill's sailing to America soon after the attack on Pearl Harbor. Cheers uh, turned to roars again for Zelensky when, in a nod of Churchill, he declared, Ukraine holds its lines and will never surrender. And that was a good line. He did remark, your money is not charity. It is an investment in the global security and democracy that we handle in the most responsible way. And that's something that he really needed to shore up to the um, right who is concerned about this and who's also been hearing Russian propaganda points saying, oh, no, it's he's just so there's corruption and he's sending the, you know, the, the money to his cronies and the weapons to his friends and who's, you know, it's going to get on the black market and that kind of thing. He added, your support is critical. We have artillery. Yes. Thank you. We have it. Is it enough? Honestly, not really. <laughs> it was actually a pretty funny line, but it, it, it hit properly. It, it was like, it, it set the right tone. Anyway. Okay. Let me keep going on. Um, Interfax Ukraine also talking about it. We've given the Ukraine what they've needed uh, to defend themselves. And since the evasion has resulted in more than 20 billion in terms of security assistance, just as I approve another 1.8 billion of additional assistance to Ukraine for its success on a battlefield. And then I've spent hundreds of hours face to face with our European allies. And, and I'll talk more about this in just another article just like two or three articles away. So that's Biden meeting with Zelensky. They met in the Oval. Then they had a joint press conference before Zelensky spoke to Congress. So here we see the Kremlin's not happy yet with it. Go figure. The Kremlin says the United States offering Patriot missile systems to Ukraine and lack of discussions on peace talks is evidence that the U.S. was fighting a proxy war. Well, they've been saying that the U.S. was fighting a proxy war for the last 10 months almost. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's not like this is going to stop them from saying that kind of thing. Um, another article, Zelensky's speech in full. If you want to see the entire speech, you can either watch it with me. You can read it below. I'll put the link below. But I said last night, this was going to be a headline picture. And you're going to see this because uh, after he handed a, a, a flag that he carried from the front line in Bakhmut to uh, the U.S. Congress, they handed him a flag that was flown over the Capitol in his honor. The Ukrainian president, Volodymyr Zelensky, gave a defiant address to a joint session of Congress in which he vowed that his country would never abandon resistance to Russian aggression. OK, so um, I'm not going to go into this article. It's the same stuff. Um, 
I'm trying to find commentary that tr kind of triangulates and shows you some different perspectives of things. The Kremlin has warned that the U.S. sending more weapons to Ukraine will only aggravate the devastating 10-month war. <laughs> Of course, like if you if you think that you're going to win and this is just going to prolong it, then, you know, all the extra unnecessary suffering. But the U.S. isn't looking at it like that. The U.S. is looking at it like, yeah, you know, but we're going to make sure that you lose. So the suffering is what's necessary to get to the point where you lose and there's not even more suffering on the other side. Special emphasis would go to developing his country's nuclear forces, which he described as the main guarantee of Russian sovereignty. I'll show you this in the RT version of the meeting that uh, Putin just had. He's he's warning, you know, hey, you know, they shouldn't be doing this. But he's saying more than that. Before I do that, one more article in The Atlantic about uh, Congress and, uh, you know, what Zelensky's speech was like in Congress. This is by David Frum. The Atlantic is somewhat of a left-leaning magazine, but, but this, uh, I think, hit all the right notes. So much of the world depends on you, Zelensky said. And I think that, that's right. Of, of all the mo many moving words in President Vladimir Zelensky's speech to a joint meeting of the U.S. Congress, those eight may have been the most urgent and important. Now, if you're not an American, you can probably safely discount what I'm about to say. But if you are an American, this resonated, right? This spoke to us. And I, I think you'll understand in just a moment. This mood of democratic recession enabled, so he talked about democratic recession, Re dem democracies either receding, there are fewer democracies, or it's just the inviting and focus on themselves and, and moving away from being have being a spreadable positive force in the world this mood of democratic recession enabled russian president vladimir putin's aggression against ukraine he regarded ukraine as weak and vulnerable and ukraine's allies as divided and ineffectual when he ordered the invasion of 10 months ago putin apparently expected to roll into kiev in days he seemingly expected the rest of the world to grumble and then come to terms what a mistake ukraine fought the assistance worked, the invasion was stopped and then reversed, and the intended victim began to win. Zelensky spoke of bicameral and bipartisan support. I talked about that at least three times he mentioned that in this speech. That sounded a surprising note because it, it, an important faction in Congress and its conservative media has aligned with Putin against Ukraine. Now, not completely, but you'll have people like Tucker Carlson that just went off the rails. The rest of Fox News hasn't been terrible. I mean... If you're a liberal, you think Fox News is terrible. But what I'm saying is they haven't gone off the rails entirely. But Tucker is like the standard bearer for Putin propaganda points, which is un unfortunate. Um, but Zelensky was using words not to describe reality. He was using words to change reality. That's right. He, he was trying to pulled them back over into the fold. And I think that's that's right. But the investment, not charity argument is even more powerful when measured against uh, less materially. What Western world is getting in return for its aid is a powerful recommitment to its own best self. Yeah, that that's right. I think uh, they did a really good job with this particular article. And um, he was calling us back to where we are. And, and great leaders have historically done that. When Martin Luther King Jr. was invoking the words of the founding fathers, he called us back in the civil rights era, back to our best self. And, and I think this is the same kind of thing. Okay, let's look at just one more thing before we look at fun with Russian state media. Um, and this is the British BBC. And they're carrying this really interesting story from a day ago. Russia, not to blame for the conflict. Hmm? OK, so Putin says that uh, he continued to see Ukraine as a brotherly nation. Wow. Don't treat me like a brother. <laughs> OK, in February, President Putin sent up to 200,000 troops into Ukraine. He argued that the conflict was a result of policy of third countries. That is, he's blaming the West for why he had to do to Ukraine what he's doing. This theory, which implies Western expansion is the cause, has been repeatedly dismissed outside of Russia. He said, for years, we tried to build good neighborly relations with Ukraine, offering loans and cheap energy, but that did not work. In his address, uh, Putin continued, there's nothing to accuse us of. We've always seen Ukrainians as a brotherly people, and I still think so. Well, they don't think so. They're down to 2% that think anything good of you. Uh, what's happening now is a tragedy, but it's not our fault. <laughs> he, he reminds me of a... Um, uh, a spouse beater, a wife beater that is just like he's drunk and doesn't know what he's, you know, that he's 
so detached from reality. And it's like her fault, man. She made me do it. I'm like, okay. All right. Now it's time for some fun with Russian state media. In our first article, we see the reflection of this in Pravda. Putin, I still think of Ukrainians as our brotherly nation. What's happening is not our fault. And he lists all these things. So this is a uh, was a, essentially a dog and pony show. It's it's political theater where Putin meets with uh, Shogu and then he says his points and Shogu says his points and nothing was really learned. It was all scripted. He says he still considers Ukraine his brotherly nation. Everything a fighter needs will be modernized and reliable and we have everything that we need. And Shogu says the primary goal in 2023 is to continue the special operation until its full completion. It's it's all going according to plan, you know, that kind of nonsense. And it just lists out all the bullet points. All nonsense. All political theater. Okay. Uh, Zelensky arrives in the U.S. demanding more weapons. Now, when you read the speech or if you listen to the speech, he sent a really good tone of not demanding more, but being very thankful, being grateful, saying, I appreciate this aid. We're using it responsibly. We're, we're defending our common values and that kind of thing. But this doesn't sound like that. And so here we have, in addition to the artillery and rocket ammunition, the $185 billion package, another $45 billion for Ukraine has been earmarked in the uh, omnibus bill uh, for Thursday. This was uh, Jen Psaki talking, and she said uh, what was going to happen in the speech. Americans should, should, should expect many well-deserved standing ovations and calling it a, quote, sales pitch to Congress and the public at a time when U.S. support for Ukraine was decreasing. Now, she didn't mean it in a negative way, but it's carried kind of here as a negative thing. Uh, the Russian Defense Ministry estimating a t uh, total NATO support for Kiev at over $97 billion. Now, I don't know if that's a true figure or not, but that's a pretty significant figure. Let's let's assume it's in the neighborhood, give or take 20 billion, right? I mean, that is pretty significant support. I don't know how Russia thinks it's going to actually win with that arrayed against it. Zelensky wants more. We're grateful for their support, but it's not enough. And it's, it makes him sound like a beggar as opposed to the way that I showed you how it went earlier. Uh, another article about the same kind of thing. Biden explains why Zelensky can't get everything that he wants. And now it's true, but the way that they frame it is not true. The last one, the last of the questions, this was in Biden's uh, um, press conference with Zelensky. And the last one came from a Ukrainian journalist who asked why the West doesn't simply give Ukraine all capabilities it needs to liberate all territories. And that was a good question. It was the very last one. Uh, his answer is yes, the U.S. president uh, deadpan, um, pointing to Zelensky, who said, I would agree. Um about, you know, they're going to give those weapons. Biden then pointed out that uh, the U.S. dedicated an enormous amount of security assistance to Ukraine. And then he talked about how he had to like really work to keep his NATO allies together and he's not going to do anything that's going to break that alliance. And that was a good answer, but that's not the way that this is carried. The prospect of breaking up NATO and breaking up Europe and the rest of the world is what he's worried about. They're not looking for a third world war uh, by fighting Russia directly. And they're not. And, you know, people will ask me like, my conservative friends that tend to be more isolationist or opposed to funding Ukraine will say, well, I don't want to get into World War III or it's not worth nuking my kids. <laughs> I don't want that either. I mean, this is precisely the point. We, we're trying to stop Putin from becoming Hitler, right? You stop him here, it doesn't get worse. So, all right. Uh, anyway, uh, here... <laughs> This one was amazing. Zelensky goes to USA for U.S. citizenship, bank accounts, and property in Florida. Um, really? That's not what he was there for. And they sort of talked about the law prohibits Zelensky from leaving Ukraine. Zelensky is taking a risk because men of military age are prohibited from leaving Ukraine. I'm pretty sure they're okay with him going to bring back billions of dollars in aid. Uh, it appears that Joe Biden, who needs Zelensky to come to Washington to gain political image inside the U.S., well, he needed that before the midterm elections. He can safely ignore anything about that for another year. Um, that's not the issue. Uh, Zelensky, he might be tra traveling to the United States to confirm his American citizenship, a bank account, and property in Florida. Okay. He might be. So they're speculating. Yeah, he also might be a unicorn who shoots rainbows out of his butt. But that's all might. It's speculative. And but they're trying to make it seem like it's this whole thing. That's the headline here. Right. Zelensky goes to USA for citizenship. This is not 
journalism. This is a propaganda piece, and that's that's pretty much all it is. The share of Americans who believe that the United States should continue to support Ukraine currently amounts to about 40%. I don't believe that that's correct. I believe it's north of 50%, but it has been dwindling. And so, um, yeah, this is just, this is terrible, terrible journalism in Pravda. Okay, last article. Uh, honest, intrepid journalist asks, what lunatic asylum let you out? Now, it's fascinating because they use this picture of Zelensky and Stoltenberg, and it looks like Stoltenberg is kind of giving it to Zelensky. And this picture was likely predating anything related to the war. Now, the article goes on and says it probably didn't happen in real life. The question, the question of what lunatic asylum lets you out? <laughs> But the asking did not come from a real journalist, let alone an honest one. Not from Western sources, that's for sure. What? Okay, now this article is totally disjointed, and it doesn't even make sense in some places, And but they're trying to make Zelensky look terrible. And But they had this really interesting little bit in here. So you can safely skip the rest of the article. I read it, but you don't have to. You're welcome. Um, but it said this. Many Western leaders have a fervent belief in democracy, and they all have an even more fervent hatred for Russia. By any other name, these are what we call Russophobes. Now, again, this is for Pravda. So this is what, what they're consuming. Um we weren't Russophobes this time last year. In, in fact, they, they talk about how they have Putin derangement syndrome, PDS. Now, I don't know that that's going to stick, at least not in the West. It might stick in Russia. I don't know. But we didn't have PDS this time last year. As I, as I speak, it's December 22nd. Um, December 22nd last year, we were safely ignoring Russia. We were just like, you know, okay, whatever he's doing over there in Russia, it doesn't, doesn't really matter. But when he invaded Ukraine and started to um, destabilize the world by knocking over his neighbor and, and giving it an example to other would-be dictators around the world, and <laughs> it, it became a really a real thing. So we, we fervently care about what Putin is doing or not doing right now because of what his actions were, not because we came with some preconceived... And, and now that's not true for everybody. I'm sure there are a couple people somewhere around the world that just hated Putin all the way around, but I didn't care. I mean, I it's like, hey, he's not a great guy, but you know, as long as he's not doing this kind of thing, but when he started doing this kind of thing, the rest of us started paying attention. So, um, yeah, this is the kind of thing that passes for journalism in Pravda, and it spreads throughout Russia and throughout other Russian sympathetic kind of places within the world in Asia and Africa. All right, so last thing, I just want you to be aware you should be uh, doing whatever you can to identify with people in Ukraine. Buy a mug, buy a hat, do something to um, draw yourself closer to that. I, you know, if you do, you'll just act and think differently. I would urge you to think in those kind of categories. If you don't want to buy something that's supporting a Ukrainian entrepreneur, as this is, then give money to a, a, a reasonable charity that you know is going to be uh, responsible with the money, like Samaritan's Purse. I put the links for both of these in the description below. Thank you for your time. Thank you for being the kind of person that cares about Ukraine.